go. Hi, everyone. Uh, just a minute here. We are getting set up. We're currently doing the traditional tutorial, and uh, we're setting it up so there's more light in the room so you guys can see the paper more. So give us just one more second as we set up. And as always, if you want to put where you're watching the stream from, and we'll do a quick shout-out, I'm going to go and grab a lamp really quick, and then Joe, you can start shouting out. <laughs> uh, we got hi from Germany from Patricia. Hello, Patricia. Nefertiti. Ooh. Hello. Uh, do, 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 do. Teal from Belgium, as usual. Hello. Uh, Micah from Alabama. Regards from Lithuania, from Dave T. Jake Scott, welcome back, Jake. Uh, Kanesha Cunningham from Canada. Ebrar from Toronto. Andrea from Germany. Jimmy from Sweden. Hey, Jimmy. Beatrice from Belgium. Mizzy from Serbia, and well, that's a cool name, Exilus John Lopez. All right, well, welcome everybody. Um, as we are setting all of this up, uh, we were wondering. Uh, we're probably gonna have to get you guys feedback on uh, the lights in the situation. So. Uh, when we do actually set this up, we'll see what how it looks. You can guys can let us know. Hello, Renato. Oh, hello, Dennis. Hello from my office. We're getting. Ooh. We're already getting some questions about clothes. About what? Clothing. <laughs> uh, please disregard my clothing options for today. <laughs> oh, no, not, not yours. They just want to know how to draw clothes. Oh, good. <laughs> they're not like, they're that much of a concern. <laughs> they're like, ew. Yeah. What are you wearing? Did you just wake up? <laughs> All right, let me see if this lighting looks better. Well, yeah, hello, everyone. Uh, we were also a little tad behind because um, if you were here two weeks ago, I talked about how a bird flew into my back window. And today we found two more birds, and one was in the front yard, one was in the back. And we have one roommate taking pictures right now, and we're hoping it's not an omen. We're hoping it's like... <laughs> I, I don't know what we're hoping it is, uh, but we're using it, I guess, as study material because as artists, we take what we're given and we're... Uh, using it to our advantage here. Uh, Cisco Pudge 67 says, Hi from Iowa. Peter called wants to know the location of a particular skullless bird. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no comment. I plead the fifth. <laughs> okay, I think we're good now. All right, so now I'm going to go to the so social medias really quick and then post that we're live streaming, and then we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, this one was definitely a requested one. I feel like uh, the traditional ones, at first I wasn't sure if you guys would enjoy them, but it definitely seems like you do and you want to see more. And I'm more than happy to do some traditional drawing. I really, really enjoy doing traditional stuff. Any other funny ones or <laughs> Lily Lily says O M I'm guessing there's supposed to be a G there. It says didn't know it was Wednesday, but I have been blessed as I just found out the live stream was happening. Hello from Wales, and I love your book, Tim. It means a lot. I'll do an Etsy review when I can. Oh, thank you. Happy that means a lot. Um, if you guys uh, don't know, I released a book recently. I don't think I have one anywhere near me. Oh, yes, I do. One second. Uh, 
So I just put them on my Etsy store. You can get it. Uh, it's pretty much a collection of 44 pages worth of sketches that I did over the last two years. And I'm really excited because I'm already working on the new one, and I already have like 50 sketches done. So that won't be out until like 2017, but um, I'm excited for that one. Uh, Gio wants to know, did you get the feathers yet? I really hope they didn't get lost or confiscated. No, I did not get the feathers yet. Um, I'm assuming just because it's international, it's going to take a little bit. But I, I, I really do want to say thank you for sending over a box of feathers. That's probably the coolest thing I've received in the mail from uh, someone I've never met in person before. So thank you. OK, almost done. One more, and then we'll go ahead and get started. Also, she wants you to post the pictures of the birds. That's so interesting for studies. Or if you don't want to post, can you send them to me? <laughs> um, actually, yeah. I decided I'm going to create a Pinterest board, and I'm going to start uploading. Because I take photos not just of dead birds around the house, but uh, of everywhere I go, I usually bring a camera, or my uh, camera on my phone's pretty good. So I take photos of either textures, color palettes, environment stuff that intrigues me, or structures. So uh, I'm going to put those all on my Pinterest board so that Rather than having people ask if I can send it to them, I'll just have a collection there. And uh, that's a boy. OK. All right, we're all good. All right, you ready, Joe? Mm-hmm. All right. Hi, everyone. Officially welcome to the start of this Wednesday live stream. Uh, here at CG Cookie, we do these every Wednesday for the 2D digital art section. And it's always at 2 p.m. Central Time, and it's minus 5 GMT. And usually the topic is posted about two hours beforehand, and then we go at 2. Sometimes, like today, we might be just a tad late, but I'll always give you a justifiable reason why we're just a little behind schedule. All right. So today's live stream, we're going to be doing traditional sketching for profiles. And I set up my rig here. I don't know how well you can see it, but... Here's the camera, and it's going to be pointing down at the sketch. There might be some focusing problems from here and there, but uh, I'm going to do my best to keep my hand as close to the paper without having to pick up too much. But before we start, I wanted to kind of talk about the materials I'm going to be working with. So firstly, a sketchbook. There's not much that I would recommend about using a sketchbook except for, let me flip to the front here, the paper weight. So the paperweight is usually somewhere on the cover, and this is a 75-pound paperweight. Now, usually it doesn't matter too much depending on if you're just doing like quick sketching, but I prefer a thicker paper, and it usually doesn't rub off on the other paper as much. It's not as flimsy. Or it's thicker, so it, it, I, I believe it holds more of the pencil, uh, the density that you push down because there's more paper to it. So I would definitely recommend a heavier paper, but you don't want to get too heavy where it's more for like watercolors, because then at that point I think it's so it might have so much of a texture to it that it, it becomes a little harder to blend. So I would find something right in between. And then for the materials or for the actual tools, um, this is the mechanical just a basic mechanical pencil that I use. Uh, usually I start off with this just to get things kind of set in place and create a foundation. And then when I want to do the detail work, if I want to get more into the finer details, I use this, which, as you can see, uh, it's my kind of lucky yellow pencil that I use for everything. But the important thing is right here, I don't know if it'll focus or not. Maybe not. But it says 0.3 millimeters. And that's the size of the lead. So let me show you the, the difference here. All right, so... Hopefully it'll focus a little bit, but pretty much you can see how the yellow lead is definitely smaller than um, normal mechanical pencil. It's actually less than half the size. So it, in my opinion, it creates a huge difference when you're trying to do detailing. So if, you, if you've never tried a 0.3, at least try a 0.5. Those you can find in most stores, but 0.3 you might have to order online. Or uh, check your local art store because they're, they're actually harder to find than I thought they would be. So like... Uh, Hobby Lobby didn't have it, if you guys have that around you, or Michael's. Neither of them had a .3. I had to get it at a specialty art store. All right, so now we're going to actually start. And as always, if you have any questions, even if it doesn't pertain to what I'm working on, feel free to ask it in the questions. And Joe is here. Say hi. 
Hi. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he's acting as the moderator to help feed the questions and answer some himself. So with that, I'm going to switch over to my other camera here. Uh, speaking of questions, the first yes. question I have for you today, Tim, is what kind of shampoo do you use from Dave T? <laughs> Without getting too much detail away, I have really raggedy hair, and I, I have to use a special shampoo to keep it feeling like hair rather than straw. So that's all I'm going to say. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so here is the sketchbook. I have a light on it, and I'm going to move it just a tad so we're in the center. I'm going to straighten it out for you guys, too, so that it makes more sense. Oh, you know what? I'm going to turn it upside down. I was going to say, could you make it so that everything's not upside down? I just thought of that. I was like, oh, everything's going to be uh, upside down. Go ahead. And... All right, we can focus it. There we go. All right, so like I said, I'm going to start off with my mechanical pencil. And uh, the, if you guys don't hear me as clearly, it's because the micro, microphone's turned to the side right now because the camera is attached to the microphone. So that's why it might be a little iffy. Okay, hopefully it stays focused. I think I just need to go out and get a non-autofocus camera so that I can just focus it on the paper uh, with and then uh, work work like that. Is this backwards? Oh, no, it's just mirrored. Okay, that works, too. All right, so working traditionally. So uh, there's a few ways that you can do this, and there's no right way to do it. And that's why me and Joe were even talking about this earlier this week and last week about how do people learn? And when they see something, how do they go about drawing it? Like, what's the process in their head as they draw it? Because usually when I see something, I try to separate, like, even if I was drawing this hand right there, I would look at the different shapes of it. So like this line, I would really want to draw first, and then I would work up that shadow, and then I would go around this way. I usually don't start with like, I don't block out the, all the different shapes, and I don't go for a more traditional fundamental way of doing it. And it's not wrong, but it's not right either. So I think it that depends on you as an artist and how you go about doing it, and what works best for you is what you should focus on. It's like even drawing profiles, I always start with a circle, and that's literally the only foundation shape I start with, because then I kind of just go with it. And I feel like I've gotten to a point where I've drawn so many profiles that uh, I feel pretty comfortable drawing in the different shapes and keeping it proportional. And the key for me is keeping them relative to each other. Okay, so hold on, let me throw in some sketches here. And then I think it focuses when I pull my hand away. So every now and then, I'll talk, and then I'll try to remember to pull my hand away so you can see what the drawing looks like. So the biggest thing with the eye socket is I always think of a skull. And hopefully this might work for you, too. It wouldn't work better if I zoomed in a little. Is that better? Yeah, that's, that's super clear. OK. Maybe I'll try to make it so my hand's not in the frame as much. Oh, then we get that shadow. Maybe I'll turn it like that. Okay. Oh, man. This is going to be a challenge because the microphone's, like, obstructing my view from the drawing. I can hear you pretty well, so it's, it's okay. Okay. Oh, boy. I'm going to have to move this slightly. There we go. Okay. So when doing the eye socket, I if you can imagine what the skull looks like from the side, and I would use a reference for this, it has, like, this deep pocket, and it's inset, and I always think of that when I draw the side of the face because then the bottom part here kind of leads and lends itself into the cheekbone line. So I always like drawing the socket and then put the eyeball, or at least place the skin folds that are surrounding the eyeball in that socket. And remember, you don't want to be too close to the edge of the nose, but if you're too far away, I mean, some people do have a very long extended uh, nose bridge. But for the most part, I try to keep it more uh, neutral. And while I'm doing this, I'm not pushing down super hard. So like um, this, you'll never see me do this kind of heavy strokes in the beginning. I'm always keeping it very light, very fluid, and I'm not going for uh, a crisp outline. I think that's the worst thing I see young artists doing 
or even on this, if I want to add like a few more gesture lines to the face, I always try to work with them rather than see them as a problem. Because if you really need to erase it, and that's I guess the one thing I forgot to mention before I started, so I have this, where's the camera? I have this rubber eraser, and it's not gum. Uh, it's yellow because it's banana scented. I got it in Australia, and banana's my favorite flavor, so I thought it was kind of a fun uh, fine. So that is my rubber um, eraser, and then I can use that to erase those lines that are more loose if I don't feel they're helping the piece, if they're distracting, whatever it might be. And I, I kind of went fast, but for the nose part, when I draw it, I always think of uh, the shape, and it's more like triangular, and pushing it out enough without going too much. So I'm keeping it relative to that eye socket, and when I do the edge here, then I'm doing the, the little gap between the nose and the top of the mouth. And usually this width and this width, so like this, 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 and this, I usually keep relatively the same. So those four lines where it creates kind of this curve, I usually try to keep the same length Then I curve around to the chin. Now you might be wondering, well, how did you know how big those are supposed to be and what, uh, how big the chin is supposed to be relative to the lips? And as we always talk about, having those little guidelines in your head, and the biggest one is keeping it proportional. So the three-step process... See if I can draw it accurately. Oops. And mind you, this is more of a guideline to help you. It's not 100% uh, every time because usually when you're drawing, it's not going to be a perfect profile or a perfect straight on. And you have to kind of take into the account of the angles of the face or the perspective you're drawing it from. But the general rule is the top of the forehead, so where the, the hair would start, the hairline if you want to call it that, from there to the the eyebrow would be section number one. I'll do a little... And remember, it's wrapping around the head. Then the second section is from the eyebrow to the bottom of the nose. And then the third section is from the bottom of the nose to the bottom of the chin. So those three sections should be relatively proportional to each other. So they should be about the same length. And if when you do enough profiles and you draw enough faces, you don't even have to think about it because it's so ingrained in your memory on how to draw it that when your, your hand is moving and you're drawing the different sections, it just kind of comes naturally. So sometimes I forget to explain that, but just know if you draw enough of it, it really does become a second nature thing where you, you really aren't thinking about it. And then depending on how defined I want the jaw to be, I'll leave the area in between, like here, a little lighter. The area under the head, I usually do add just a indication of a shadow, give it some. It's like an occlusion shadow at that point. And then the ear placement is another one of those things where you use reference. And the big thing I want to talk about with profiles is the head is not a circle. And you, I think the best thing to do is look at a skull for reference for this because you can see how jutted out the skull is where if you did a circle, it would only go to like here. Well, that's not correct. You want to push it back. And if it is a bald character, I usually like to see more little grooves and bumps and have it not be a perfect smooth back of the head. Because if you think about your skull, even like if you feel with your hand to the back of your head, you can feel that there's more of a drop off in certain areas. And I like to see that represented. Even like the top of the head, sometimes I'll keep more flat rather than round. It just kind of depends on the skull that you're trying to create, which would be represented in this, the head itself. And then the ear. And uh, as always, when I do the ear, I do the outline first, and that outline is in that second section. So the ear is completely in section number two. So the top of the ear should line up with the, the eyebrows, and the bottom of the ear should line up with the bottom of the nose. Now, remember, this is just a generality where there will be times where the ear might be a little smaller, a little bigger, more pushed out. This is just like a general rule to go by, and then you can edit it depending on the, the look that you're going for.
Now for the ear, I'm going to do the hook, and then the Y, and then the bump. And that's how I, I draw all of my ears. And if you want to see more on that, you can uh, check out the tutorial, the visual guide, I should say. It's not even a video tutorial on how to draw the ear and how to see it in different uh, shapes and sizes. So now I'm not going to go ahead and shade that yet, because now I want to talk first about the hairline itself, because this is very important. So seeing it at a side view, you don't want to just cut the line from the top of the forehead to the ear, because this is not a hairline. That does not work. What you want to do is take into account the different uh, areas where the hairline pushes in, curves around, and then the actual uh, sideburns, they don't go right up to the ear. They actually cut a little above and around the ear lobe itself, or the ear, sorry, the lobe's down here. And then the back of the head, it's usually like here. So it's never like right up against the jawline, it's pushed back, and then same with around the ear, it's never right on the ear, it's actually pushed out just a tad. I usually like to blend it out. So now, um, I guess, is there any questions before I start value shading? <laughs> we have tons of questions. Okay. <laughs> uh, there, are, there are some ones that are uh, more about art in general, but I'll ask ones that are more per pertaining to actual what you're doing. Um, oh, actually, I like drawing the road while we're doing this. Yeah, so uh, Jill asked two questions, actually, that were pretty good. Um, it says, can you, can you draw an open mouth? In the profile view, and what's the biggest difference between female and male profiles? Oh, that's a good idea. Okay, so then this will be a female, and then I'll do a male next to it. Um, open mouth, I feel like, is more about expressions, and that definitely use reference and use pictures of yourself. I I can't tell you how embarrassing it is when someone opens my iPhoto on my computer because it's almost all self-reference pictures. <laughs> And for that example, I would literally, before I even start drawing, I would take a picture of myself having my mouth open or screaming, whatever look I'm desiring, and then I would use that as my reference. Usually, the general general idea of what I would think it would look like is I know that there would be stretch lines and there would be tension in the skin because of the muscles being pushed and lifted. And this would be more open. And I don't want to have to, I don't want to redraw this because I feel like we could go on a whole other tutorial on expressions alone. But I think the biggest thing is making sure that when you open the mouth, it feels accurate. It feels proportional because sometimes the chin gets dropped down too low, and then you you totally throw off the look of it because then it becomes more cartoony or stylized, and that probably isn't the desired look that you're going for. So for that, I would just say is use reference. But I can talk about the male and female difference, as I'll draw a male profile on the side here. Okay, I'm going to once again kind of draw under my microphone here. Uh, Lily uh, who's good? Yeah. Who's good? says, I've been feeling pushed to learn more about anatomy right now, as in like muscle structures, but I feel it's very technical and analytical, which I'm not sure suits my looser uh, leading style. I'm guessing that's supposed to be learning. Uh, should I keep pushing or find something I find more natural for myself? You know, I, I can see both ways. And this goes back to the idea of how do you learn. And uh, for me, I'm definitely more loose now. But I used to be very technical, and then learning about the muscle structures, I would draw them exactly as I saw them. I would try to understand how they work. So I think this might be one of those things where just push through it, really like challenge yourself to maybe see it in, an, in a, a good light where you're seeing that there is learning behind this and that understanding anatomy will help your looser style once you have a better idea of how anatomy works. And I think... It's it's tough where sometimes you've got to be forced to draw things maybe you you aren't comfortable or you don't want to draw, but I promise you it will help the other areas of your drawing ability, and I guess with the the analytical thing, where maybe do the study of the muscle structures in your loose style. I don't see any problem with that. I mean unless if you're doing it for a class and your teacher wants you to be as you know crisp as possible, then I would definitely follow her rule. 
But just know, once that class is over, you can definitely take it however you want. Maybe do studies of anatomy, but keep it more loose. Uh, okay, really quick. So doing the male profile, there's some things that I usually will push just a little further. And usually that's the, the top of the forehead. I might cave in just a little bit. Where females, I like to keep it more round. And remember, these are more generalities. You don't have to do it. And some guys have more feminine traits, and some girls have more masculine traits. And there's no right or wrong. But usually if you want something to appear more masculine, this is the generalities I can show you. Uh, the nose, I think, is a very strong feature on a male character if you're trying to create more of that masculine sense. So I'll either make it larger, I'll have it broken, I'll have it more inset. But usually keeping it bigger and not so smooth and rounded out will give it more of that masculine appearance. And mind you, I'm not trying to like... You don't have to think of uh, drawing masculine figures in more of a... I, I don't want to say ugly way, because I actually find a lot of these traits more beautiful where uh, there's more details and there's more things that you can draw. So usually you can have more fun with them. But uh, I guess it's that whole appearance of something looking strong versus something looking smooth and soft. So for a guy's skull, when I'm doing this, I either will have them more inset back. I usually have the, sm the eyes not quite as open. And then maybe the upper skin flap will be smaller compared to like over here where they're more there's more upper lid exposed. For this one I'll keep not quite as open. Uh, Jake Scott has a question and a suggestion. He asks, can Tim grow a beard? <laughs> uh, yeah, I've been trying. It's uh, been taking about six years now. <laughs> Uh, and, his, and his suggestion is uh, y'all should get some photo photography based li LED lights close to the size of a brick, very bright. The price ranges from three to fifty dollars typically. Yeah, actually, we were talking about doing that, where we we're going to have our own light room and uh, take reference photos and actually get like models in. Where models, I say in air quotes, where we would take photos of people in different poses and uh, give those out to uh, the cookie community. So now another big thing is making this chin more strong. And to do that, I usually have it more pronounced. And sometimes with females, you can even curve it down just a bit. Or if they're younger, sometimes younger males have that too, where it's not quite as pronounced. It's more of a curve. Or if you're trying to make it more masculine, I definitely have it more pronounced. And I have pull it down first and then go in. Ebrar asks, is there, a spe is there some special method that you used when you first learned anatomy? If not, how did you first learn anatomy? You know, that's such a strange question. I feel like the older I get, the less I remember how I learned anatomy. But it always came from just drawing it in my spare time. And I always had a fascination with drawing people. So I think all my life I've drawn people. And I think when you do that, it kind of gives way to drawing anatomy structures. And if you could see the drawings I did in high school, uh, the anatomy is definitely very wrong. I can admit that freely. But then when I went to college, I took a life drawing class. And I think that was the one class I really felt like I took away a lot from. Because having the models right in front of you and then seeing it in uh, a perspective rather than through a photo or through Google image, uh, it definitely gives you more clarity on the actual proportions and seeing them. So I guess my biggest advice is try to find a life drawing class that you can take. I was even talking to my uh, Joe and Corinna about those are my roommates and I want to talk uh, to them about going to a life drawing class in the fall or in the winter because I think there's so much that you can learn not even from a teacher but just from yourself and really seeing the models and trying to capture the pose and the structures and there's something that you just can't get by doing it through photo reference. And I think you really need to be there in person to capture that. Faith Newman asks, what are the main jobs of a concept artist? Does this include turnaround and full illustration, or just character, or just the rough design? 
Um, so if you guys know, I didn't actually ever have a concept art job. I worked at CG, right, CG Cookie right out the gate when I graduated, but from the experience I have with my friends and the art people that I've come to know that are in the industry, usually as a concept artist, you're doing zero illustration work. There's artists there that do illustrations and purely just that. So the concept artist, and the one in particular is uh, Paul Hoffner. He works at Riot, and him and I used to go to school together. But what he does is he'll do uh, quick sketches, idea sketching, turnarounds. He'll have the character in a few different poses. But it's not the poses you might be thinking of. It's like there will be a front pose, then maybe a side pose, and then the arm itself will be separated then usually these will be on a separate layer, and then you draw on top of it on different layers, and then you can inter like mix out layers to show your senior concept designer or art director. And usually if they pick one, then they'll have you do slight variations of that one costume or idea, and then from there you would kind of finish it off where you wouldn't really polish it, but then you would pass it to the illustrator who would then take it on into more of the of the illustration sense. So as a concept artist, you definitely are doing things that are generating ideas. You're an idea generator, and you're not really looking to uh, polish the work that you're creating. You have to trust in the illustrator that will do it for you. Oh, and when drawing males um, on their neck, I try to make the Adam's apple a bit more pronounced in the hump, just so it's even more uh, clear since males usually have more of a pronounced Adam's apple, and then I bring this line up. That's usually how I do uh, my male my male head versus my female. Let me see if I can. So it's a lot of it is just little nuances, so like having it more squared off. And I think if that's the one thing that you can take away is females think more round and fluid shapes. Males think a little more rugged, a little more squared off. And that's usually the difference between the two if you want to go for the generalities. Um, I think I'm going to... I'll do one more, and then I'll do more of a cleaned up version of that head and do some shading on it as well. So what, we got like another half hour? Yeah, I could definitely got time for that. And I saw... A really good question. I lost it uh, really fast. Uh, Dennis wants to know, speaking of books, have they shipped yet? Uh, no. They're, I was going to ship them yesterday, but then there was one of the Kickstarter backers that wanted a specific one, so I wanted to contact him first and make sure he gets the one he wants, and then I'm shipping them out. But Dennis, I actually wrote yours all out, and I wrote the inside cover and everything, so expect that to be shipped out in the next few days. And thank you again. Ooh, doo, doo. Where did that one go? Oh, uh, Alpha Gusta asks, is it possible for you to show or explain how the neck works and moves in profile as the person is looking up and down? Uh, yes. I, I think, uh, I forgot what teacher it was, but they always told me to think of the neck as a cylinder. And it's there, the cylinder is propping the head up. So, like, let me put this a little in perspective here. So if you can imagine, this is a cylinder. Uh, or even if you think of it as, like, a neck wrap, I always try to place uh, different shapes and forms in the subject matter I'm creating so it feels more in perspective. So for the neck, I always think of a cylinder and just holding the head up. And uh, when you're, you're moving the head up and down, the back will get more crease-like. Then this becomes more open. Or let me push it up. And then the front side of the neck becomes more open. And then when you bend your head down, and this is, you know what, this is another example of use reference, use yourself. And uh, rather than taking a picture, maybe take a video and then put, put yourself in profile and move your head up and down. And really, really, really try to start to feel the extension of the neck and like push your head as far up as it can go and then push down as far as you can go. 
And then you'll see the different kind of wrinkles and the, the tension stressing in the, the different areas of your, your neck. And that's where you can see a lot of the underlying anatomy when you really like push it to its uh, stretch. And uh, I think that's the best way to go about doing it. But always think of it in, um, a, not always, I should say. My advice would be to think of it in more of a cylindrical shape. Uh, really quick, if you guys have any uh, hair suggestions, um, I'm definitely open to maybe doing a quick uh, hair sketch on this as well. Uh, male or female, doesn't matter. Uh, Kate QVQ says, there are a few options about these birds. It may be apocalypse or angry birds. Also, dear Tim, if you touch dead birds, even came close to it, What? why aren't you scared to touch them? Um, <laughs> I like that it might be angry birds. Someone's like a little kid's flicking birds at my house trying to knock it down. <laughs> um, for touching the bird, well, I mean, I put on gloves, but um, I guess I've, <laughs> and I, I think Joe can back me up on this. I'm not really grossed out by things, and germs was never like a big, I guess, fear of mine. So I have no problem like touching and handling it. Um, but I was definitely wearing gloves, so I don't think it... Well, I guess in my mind it justified not being gross, and I really saw it as pure study. And um, like we talked about last week, just how the old artists used to dissect and really uh, analyze dead bodies, I just see it as that kind of a opportunity where I've been presented with all these birds, and I'm going to use it as a study. Actually, really quick, I started drawing it. So you guys get a sneak peek at what I'm drawing right now. So uh, it's based on the first bird that flew into the house and how it, it's going to be bleeding this black blood because on the window it left black blood. And then I was able to study the heart, so I started drawing the heart in this rib cage that was poking out of the dead bird. And I guess that's an idea of like taking inspiration from uh, your life and things that happened to you. And in that case, it kind of slammed right into my life. and. I felt like, compelled uh, to draw it. I felt like if I didn't draw something based on it, um, then it was a missed opportunity. Uh, Jimmy Bryant wants to know, how do you draw a mohawk in profile with shaved sides? Yeah, that's a fun one to do. OK. Um, oh, shoot, this head might get in the way a little bit. Um, oh, I know what we can do. OK. So I'm going to do a mohawk that's in, like, after they wake up the next day, where it's, maybe I'll do a girl. It's, oh, you know what? I could do red. It's so it's weird that you're like, oh, I don't, like, <laughs> I can't draw on this picture. But, like, if I look at my sketchbook, it's just, like, constant, just, like, I don't care. Like, I just draw over the other thing that I was drawing. Oh, yeah, I'm super particular about that. I can't have drawings touch each other unless if it's like it has a purpose behind it. I'm very weird about separating. My drawings. <laughs> it looks clean. That's that's. I think that's the biggest thing is that it's super clean. Uh, but on mine, it's like since I, I do a lot of concept sketching, like in fast, you know, that it's just yeah. like don't care. Look at this like shape. More of a concept artist. I'm like an illustrator at this point. <laughs> uh. Alexis says, could you possibly do dreads? What? We already started on the Mohawk. <laughs> but you know what? I could... Yes, you know what? I'm going to implement both a Mohawk and dreads into this to the best of my ability. Can we also do facial hair? No, because it's a girl. <laughs> <laughs> um, I can do stubble on this guy. Where uh, For facial hair, you, usually I like to do it more quick. You don't have to... I like draw every single stubble. I like to imply facial hair, and usually that gets across if you do just enough markings. It's like if I wanted some on the lip and then have it come down to like a goatee. I feel like you can definitely get the impression of facial hair pretty quickly. And then always draw some on the neck, unless if it's clean shaven under it. Um, I always see more of a hint of realism when the facial hair comes down in the same way it does in real life, where it does encompass usually the top half of the neck, if not more, uh, covered in facial hair there. 
there was a period there where all I was drawing was just big beards, mm-hmm. like big dwarvish beards. They, I don't know why, but they're just so cool. I'm actually trying to think if I've ever drawn a beard in my life. Right? <laughs> I don't think I have. Um, Brandon Zimmerman. Brandon. So, or asks, when will we get to hear more about swordplay? <laughs> uh, soon. I'm actually almost done with uh, Chase's illustration. I know I keep saying that over and over, but I actually did work on it. And uh, if you're more curious about it, I will be uploading that in, I, I want to say next week. And if you guys don't know what swordplay is, it's my personal project that I've worked on for, I kind of had the idea back when I was in fourth grade, and I've been just, it, it never kind of gave up on me. And I, well, I guess I should say I never gave up on it. And I'm going to actually write and create a full illustrated novel based on it. And if you guys know who Red is, uh, it's the character I always draw, and even right now I feel like I'm drawing Red. Uh, that's the first illustration I did for it. Then you can see that on my site. All right, so when I'm drawing the hair, I'm totally thinking, thinking of it in shapes. And if you guys have seen my pencil sketches before, I'm not trying to draw the strands of the hair. I'm almost trying to like capture the silhouette of it. And the more jaggy the outline, the more structural it seems, rather than it being more smooth, is something that I like to work with more so than if it had, like, you know, the shading and blending all the way throughout. I almost now like making it more of a silhouette on the head and then keeping the area, like, right here more in white so it really separates the two forms. And I think this goes back to the idea of you don't have to have everything be hyper-realistic shading. And I think when you're learning, it's good to get as close to possible because then you can use that and imply it in your own style where uh, once you reach a point where you feel like you you do have a solid understanding of anatomy and uh, value and form, then have fun with it. Start breaking the rules. It's that whole idea of once you know the rules, you can start to break it. Uh, Nefertiti asks, Hi, uh, I'm an animator, and I kind of have a fear about sharing concepts for work I plan to make money off of in the future. What are your thoughts? And do you have any suggestions for creating more traffic on social media, like getting more likes and shares? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, For the first question, uh, you can't be afraid, where you can almost rely on the fact that nothing's original anymore. And actually, I've been having... Uh, doubts about that statement recently, where I I do think that things can still be original. Uh, It definitely has come from more of a personal place, but for you, if you really, you have to believe in your work, and if you believe it's solely your own and no one else could recreate it like you can, then I I don't think there should be any fear of someone taking it. Uh, But if you really have this weird feeling that there's someone that you work with that isn't very creative and they solely work on other people's ideas, then I would maybe not share your thoughts with them. But usually people aren't like that, especially a true artist won't take another artist's idea and present it as their own. And in my opinion, that's super bad karma, so I wouldn't want to deal with that. They might have uh, birds flying into their house. And then for the second question on suggestions for more traffic on social media, uh, patience. I know that sounds like a crappy answer, but I'm telling you, uh, I've been doing this social media game for like four or five years, and only recently has it really started to pick up. And uh, in the beginning, it it bothers you. It bothered me where, yeah, you're when you upload something, you're checking to see how many views you get, how many likes, what are people commenting, if you get any comments. And for like the first year, it was like seven views, zero likes, zero comments. And yeah, it's a little disheartening. But then, uh, for whatever reason, I always saw it as a challenge, and I always looked at it being like, okay, wait till I wait till you see what I do next. And it was always, maybe it was like a self-motivation way for me to continue drawing without becoming discouraged. Uh, so my number, number, number one advice is be patient. Number two, post all the time. So even with your sketches that you don't, aren't super comfortable sharing, share them, because people like seeing growth especially as an artist, where a year from now you'll be able to look back and well, hopefully you'll be able to look back and be like, wow, look at how far I've come. And other people really appreciate seeing that. Like if I was to hire someone, I definitely want to see the growth of the artist in the past year. So uh, that's my advice number two. And then three, 
post everywhere. So if you're just relying on one social media network, uh, you're kind of limiting yourself, where you never know what will be the place where you're most well known. For some people, I would say for most people, it's DeviantArt, but you'd be surprised by like um, Purple Kecleon. I would say Mel is more popular on Tumblr than anywhere else. So, oh man, I'm running out of breath, Tim. Uh, so be uh, very aware that you need to be posting on everything. And just to give you kind of a snippet, I have on my top um, bookmark here, I have my Facebook page, DeviantArt, Twitter, Tumblr, Instagram, ArtStation, DrawCrowd, and Pinterest. And that's not even including the YouTube videos I upload for CG Cookie and all the social marketing I do for that. So I think it, it definitely comes down to uh, going to as many as you can. Um, and lastly, uh, depending on how you feel about fan art, usually fan art generates more attention just because it's more relative to the viewer looking at it. And if you want to garner more attention quickly, usually that's the way to do it. But the way that I've always seen it is uh, great art will be recognized regardless of subject matter. So keep pushing yourself to be a better artist, and with in time, you'll see how the followers come. All right, so I'm going to switch over to uh, my point three pencil. So this is the structure. This is kind of the quality that I try to hit before going into detailing. And you can see I still have these uh, headlines from the circle, and they don't bother me whatsoever. If anything, I kind of like seeing the process, and I, I like when artists sometimes leave hints of that. Sorry, I keep moving my camera. I'm trying to find a good angle of it. There we go. Uh, Mike uh, asks really quick, do you have any books on designing clothes? I do. Uh, shoot. I'm going to go grab one really quick. <laughs> Talk to them for a second. Joe. All right. Um, if you guys can, I'm interested in hearing uh, your guys' opinions on how you learn, like how your process of learning art is. Um, uh, whether it be from blocking in, so like looking at shapes from a distance and seeing them blurred, or possibly you learn from doing 3D form, which I know is a very popular one uh, among a lot of artists now, and that's how a lot of structure and foundation is done, is draw the cube, draw the cube in 3D space. Uh, like Tim said, how he learns, he usually does things based on uh, value and the shapes that intrigue him. And then uh, I'm kind of a mix where I like to kind of scribble everywhere until I find something that I find very appealing to my eye. Um, and I'm, in I'm just interested to hear what you guys have to say. Uh, put Q and then uh, I and then do your response. Or what we prefer is if you guys post in the community afterwards of your opinion of that. Uh, just in the same post of the live stream would be cool. OK, I'm back. Welcome back. Let me switch to. Okay, so I couldn't find all of them, but I grabbed as many as I could really quickly. Uh, one of the ones I got, and it's going to look ridiculous, but um, I have a lot of fashion books. I'm very intrigued by the fashion world, and I uh, forgot. It wasn't Tetsuya no more, but it was another concept artist that said, great character concept artists are also have their foot in digital art and the other foot in the fashion world. Because usually they intermingle, and they take from each other so much Usually the fashion world doesn't take as much from video games, but a lot of video game character design, especially um, not so much Western as much, but usually Eastern uh, RPGs, they heavily are influenced by the fashion um, spectrum. So I have uh, 120 great fashion designs from the past 100 years, and literally it's just clothing. It's like silhouettes of character of these females wearing clothes. But I, I look at the way that the fabric is weighted on the body. I look at different, um, not only patterns, but the way it's separated from the top and lower half and um, the feeling that it's trying to express, especially with some of the, I guess, these are kind of like Titanic-ish in that generation. So I think any kind of a fashion book that just has the, the, the concepts of the fashions on a white background where it's like uh, silhouetted, it's isolated out, I think these are great. And then this was fashion design with Loesch on the cover. Uh, this one was just really great on like implementing texture on the body, 
or on the, the different fabrics. I don't know how we can see it, but it talks about how you put patterns on like that, how you create the patterns. And then let me give an example of something more concept artist -y. And something like this, where this is very uh, uh, concept artist, where you can see how the ideas are being implemented using shapes, and you're working quickly. And it's supposed to ev evoke an emotion at first sight. So that's why these are really strong, and I like looking at those, because I don't think I do that enough. And here's another one where you can see the fabric being put on, or the pattern of the fabric being put on the pants, how that's done, and then how to make it blend in seamlessly. So this one was really cool, too. Oh, and then, sorry, one more. Uh, I love seeing it in grayscale. And then they show how to add color and what colors make sense, like the difference between the silk and the leather material and what the difference is. And lastly, just a book of a pure fashion designer's collection. And let me see if I can find an example of the reason I bought this book like this. This I find utterly fascinating, and I, I love how the fabric warps around the antlers, and it's uh, there's a feeling behind it, and I like to capture that in my drawings. So uh, any kind of a fashion design book like this, I also think is great. All right, I'm going to switch back over here. Okay. Um, already, I can tell... I don't like the placement of this eye. And uh, I'm going to do what I tell all my workshop students and all people watching these live streams. Uh, redo it. If there's something that bothers you in your piece, don't just let it be because it looks good enough. That's literally the worst thing I can ever hear an artist tell me, is that something looks good enough. Uh, Dick Scott says, do you have any recommendations for people with abnormal profiles, such as overbites or underbites and crooked noses? Have fun with it. I think those are sometimes the most fun to draw, because then you're not like bound by making it look like a perfect human structure. And uh, literally, when it's like an underbite, well, you know that the bottom of the chin, oops, my hand's in the way, uh, the bottom of the chin is going to be pushed out just a little bit more and if it's an overbite, the chin's going to be a little in, or it wouldn't be as out. Um, what was the other thing? Oh, crooked noses. Um, crooked noses are e even more fun to draw with. Maybe on this male quickly. It's so like, let's say he broke his nose. Usually it's a thicker upper part. Like this. And then immediately, this tells a story where... Um, if not broken his nose, well, maybe he was insecure about his nose shape. And when someone looks at this, they can s usually they have their own interpretation. But when I see something like this, I think about that and how he must have felt having this larger nose. And usually, when I when if I ever draw characters like this, like my Miko character has a broken nose, I like having the little nose bandage on it to give it some more detail. And immediately, it it tells a story without even having to say anything. There's a story behind why is this character wearing this bandage over their nose. Then I'll, oops, sorry, my hand keeps getting away. Then I'll shade it more accordingly. So yeah, usually I like having more fun with uh, this kind of stuff. But when doing more of a general look to the head, I keep it more uh, simple looking. Oops, wrong pencil. Ebrar asks, how long did it take both of you to master the human anatomy? I'm still practicing really hard, but I feel like I, have even made that, I haven't even made that much progress. Um, I, d I would not say I've mastered the human anatomy. <laughs> right? I would say I've gotten to a point where I feel comfortable drawing certain areas, but like if you told me to draw, like, uh, let me think of a weird... Like if I had to draw something in a weird perspective and like have it stretching or like a weird dynamic angle... I would definitely have to use reference and look at maybe even taking my own reference. Because I don't think anyone ever masters it. They just get to a point where they're comfortable with areas, and then they can usually, from experience, work on what they remember. 
but yeah, I, I think that's kind of a tough one to say if I'll ever master it. Uh, Hugh Vong wants to know, can you list the books you just showed? And uh, I think we'll just put those in the comments after. Yeah, oh, and that's something that we're going to do from now on with these live streams. So on cgkiki.com slash dashboard, which is like the home page, uh, there's a uh, section called Cookie Crew Feed. So I'll, I'll post all the live stream announcements on there, and then if you click that link, it'll show all the links that we talked about during this live stream itself. So any books that I talk about, any artists that me or Joe mention, those will all be on uh, that post. And I'm sure Joe will also create a community post on it where you can find all that stuff there as well. Okay, so now when placing the pupil, I think this is the thing I see people get wrong the most. I'm going to zoom in as awkwardly and uncomfortably close as I can without it not being able to focus. Okay, so the worst thing you can do is place the pupil. Oops, I broke my tip of the pencil. So the worst thing you can do is place a pupil right in the center of the eye. Because when you're seeing it in a side view, you have to remember that the pupil would be more on the back of the, the iris itself. So it would look something more like that rather than in the front. And then there's that clear part. And it's sometimes really hard to. Uh, create that when doing it traditionally and without color. Because with color, it'd be a little easier to showcase that. But without color, I try to be very careful about the placement of that. And now, oh shoot, my hand keeps, I'll try to do it so you guys can see more. Let me see. There we go. So you might get more of my shadow of the hand, but at least you can see what I'm drawing. So now, when I'm doing the cheek shadow here, usually like to imply it very, very softly. And then I won't shade this way. So I'll only shade over the cheek here. And I'll let that contrast speak for itself. And then same with the nose bridge. So I guess while I'm shading this, is there another question? Uh, yes. From Gobtra, it says, was Wes your mentor? Wes is a lot of things for me. Uh, he, if you don't know, he is the CG Cookie um, uh, owner, uh, and he pretty much manages everything on the back end. Uh, he's just a great boss, and he works really, really hard, and he's always pushing every one of us to our limits. Uh, he wasn't my mentor in a sense of helping me learn drawing or doing 2D digital art, but he's been like a life mentor and kind of showing me the path and the way of one, treating people with respect even when a business sense, and two, always pushing yourself past what you believe you are capable of. And I think he he really does showcase that a lot with uh, not only me, but all the CG Cookie employees. And he's just someone that I, I really do respect a lot. So I guess in some ways, yes, he is my mentor, but more in like a life way rather than it being more of a drawing way. So right now, this nose line right here is too dark for my liking. It stands out, and it should be a little softer. So I'm going to go ahead and take my eraser, and sometimes I'll just dab it. I'll dab it on, and it, it does pick it up pretty well. Then I'll lay it on softer so it's not quite as harsh of a contrast. Uh, Juan V asks, can you talk about difference, differences in art conventions you've been in, like average age groups, which one, which one's originals can sell versus only art fan or only sell fan art? How much artists price their books, prints, sketches, commissions? Yeah. Um, uh, this has been something that I think me and my friends that we've been doing these cons together, we always debate over. And usually the general rule is, yes, fan art does sell better. Because when you think of it, the audience that is coming to a convention, they're going because they have a love of either comics or video games or anime, whatever it might be. So they want to see things that reflect that. And sometimes with original art, uh, it doesn't sell as well because, one, it's not recognizable. And, two, it doesn't have that immediate connection with the viewer. 
where fan art, they've already seen the show, they've played the game, they already have that connection, so now they're just looking for something to reflect that. So I don't want to get your hopes down about doing originals. My, I actually have a few friends now that only sell original, and it's a little tougher, yeah, but there's a pride and there's a sense of accomplishment when someone buys your original art versus someone that buys uh, your fan art piece. And it's something that I've been struggling with because when you know fan art makes more money and you choose not to do it, it's definitely like one of those things of uh, am I okay with the idea of not making as much money? Because then you're, then in your head your goal isn't to make money, it's becoming an artist that is proud of their work. So I think that's been very hard for me to learn myself where it's I have to trust in my own work. And if I believe in it enough, other people will as well. Uh, but in terms of pricing things, usually prints no more than $20 if you're going to an average convention. And uh, for sketchbooks, so personal sketchbooks, usually around 15 sometimes $10, $20. I would say that's about average for uh, personal sketchbooks. And then was there another question or no? Uh, no, you pretty much hit it all. OK. And go to them. They're actually a lot of fun, especially Spectrum. That's the one that I always tell Joe that's by far my favorite one. It's just so much talent in one room. You it's know? such a, like, a positive atmosphere. Yeah. And everyone's so open and welcoming. No one's like, this person. <laughs> you know? Right? They're like, what do you do? Be more like highbrow, but they're not. Yeah. All right, I'm going to the bottom of the list to try to find some uh, solid questions. Oh, and really quick, the people that were asking, so the side of her head here is shaved. So rather than like doing a dark outline to showcase that, I'm going to leave it light and more gestural so that it implies the hairline. And then maybe when I shade it down the line, I might do like some trademarks here, like little sketch marks. But I'm not going to give it a very hard, defined separation of the, the scalp or the hair that's shaved off in the skin because I want it to look very similar. But then just these few little uh, sketch lines imply that there is hair there. So it's like a quick and easy way to do uh, shaved head like this without having to detail too heavily. Oh, man, this is a good question, and I and I have kind of a slight answer to it. Uh, it says, hey, guys, I always hear you saying you should use yourself as reference, but I'm a fairly big girl, so more of my features are soft and round. What should I do? Because it's, it's hard to use myself as reference when I'm not the character body norm. That is a good question. I guess I've never really thought of that, but I still think you can use yourself as reference. I think... If anything, it'd be more unique to you. But if you really want something that is more specific to a look, um, I would, and it's not as awkward as it might sound, but I, I've done this before, but ask friends to reference for you. And I don't know what you were thinking, Joe, but I think that would be my best advice. Yeah, that's that's pretty good. What I was, was going to suggest was um, you kind of already answered your own question in, your, in, in the statement. Um, if there's something that's soft, and round, and you don't want it to be that way, draw it angular and sharp, you know? Um, try playing with with it just a bit. Uh, use your reference as the base and not for the finer detail. Uh, use the finer details. You're the one can, who has the power to manipulate those things, so go for it, you know? Mm -hmm. Oops, sorry, I keep getting my hand in the way. Uh, Hugh Vong says, question for both of you. Do you plan doing any workshops in San Francisco? Um, not, not currently. I'm, I'm trying to actually be more relaxed over the next three months. I feel like my life's been kind of crazy, and then I got back from Australia. and uh, I actually canceled a few conventions. But I do plan to go to California next year for a convention. But no, no workshops currently. I was going to say, everything's been like nonstop moving with you. Yeah. 
That's the kind of story of my life. I, I think I, I secretly I think I just like being in the fast lane. So I put myself in situations where my life has to be moving fast. Oh, I will say I was going to take that Alan Williams workshop in I think that's in Washington or Oregon. And that was the one that I was seriously planning to do. But if you're wondering about the workshops that we do at CG Cookie, they're none of them are like in person. They're all online. So I we usually don't travel to do a workshop. It's usually all done online. And mainly because a lot of the viewers are international, and to get all of us together, it would be very, very difficult to plan and coordinate and um, make that happen. Maybe one day in the future we can actually get that going, but as of right now, it's it's not feasible. Uh, this will be the last question, and then you can go do go through and do your uh, which one like you want a quick answer. Okay. This is. Question for the both of you. What is your favorite TV show, uh, not in relation to cartoons or anime? Jeez, that's a loaded one. You can go first. Um, that That is a tough one. My favorite TV show? Um, depends on what I've seen recently. Uh, I mean, I really dig pretty much anything Netflix puts out as a series recently. They've just been solid. Like Daredevil's a good show. Uh, I mean, I, we just started watching Orange Is the New, Black, or I just started watching Orange Is the New Black this past season, and I'm just blown away at how amazing that story, or like the story is and the character development is. Um, but I mean, I enjoy Game of Thrones. I know a lot of people are like falling off the wagon with that. Um, trying to think of what other. Uh, New Girl is pretty good. What about what about you, Tim? So like I said, that's a tough one. I, I really, really like Orange is the New Black. I loved House of the Woods. Um, but if I had to pick my favorite show, uh, it's kind of one that I don't know if it would be expected, but it's called The Prophet, and it's on uh, CNBC, I believe. But it's all about this guy, uh, Marcus Limonis, and he goes to failing businesses and he tries to help them out and he restructures it. But he's not uh, like vigorous or he's not uh, insulting like a lot of those show premises are. He just he's very calm and he he sees what is wrong and he's able to express that so clearly that I really appreciate him and I feel like I just look up to him as uh, someone that I would want to be when I grow up, not in like a business sense, but in the way he handles himself and the way he approaches situations. Um, and then yeah, uh, there I, there are some shows that are more, I guess, not highly regarded as like highbrow entertainment. So like Biggest Loser, I definitely enjoy the Road Rules, Real World Challenges. I I enjoy those, but yeah, I think it varies. Like Joe said, from like the shows I like three years ago, I. I would say I don't like them as much as I do now, and it's constantly evolving. So I, I hope that never stops. I hope my interest in what I, TV shows I watch is always evolving. Okay, so really quickly, uh, this was one dreadlock. It was just kind of a quick braid that I drew, but I would want to do them on the top here, the top here. So when doing dreadlocks, I guess the biggest thing is uh, going slowly, being patient with your braid work, making it really look and feel like braids. Like even this one, I should have angled it more down at the end, like here. So I think I might fix that. And uh, just remember the idea behind dreadlocks. And I know it's become kind of a social issue in the past week with uh, the Jenner girl putting her hair in dreadlocks. Where if you're doing it more as a fashion statement, just remember that there are some uh, things that are applied with dreadlocks and you want to be conscious of that and be I guess what's a good word? You don't want it to come across as offensive. You want it to be uh, more genuine. Okay, so let me go ahead and look at what we got here for questions. Oh man, you have a problem drawing curly hair? Okay, just recently. So I have curly hair and I've always hated curly hair until like the past two years. Now I love curly hair. Okay, so let's say we wanted to give this girl kind of like a fro. I would draw, actually I'm going to do, I'm going to do a grizzly style where I'm going to pull it back first. So imagine if like the back part of her hair was an afro. 
coolest thing about this is you can just shape it out with like these little etching lines. Uh, once again, I'm going to run into this head. But then on the inside, can it's I think you can be so much more expressive with curly hair because you don't have to worry so much about structure and like gravity and making sure it follows rules. Curly hair, it's almost like F the rules. I'm going to be as wild and crazy as I want because gravity doesn't affect me because my hair is thick as hell. You know? So I'm going to lay it on pretty thick. This is how I would draw curly hair. Uh, if you want it to be a little more clean, not as coarse and uh, frilly and wild, then just take your time with slower. Like if you're trying to do, let me see if I have another, maybe I'll do it on this guy. Uh, Sadly, the only reference that comes to mind is like Harry Styles. He has wavy hair that's kind of curly, but uh, I guess the public has uh, adapted it as curly hair. I've never actually saw his hair as curly, but it's more free flow, flowy with locks, so it definitely tightens into like individual curls. And with this, then you do have to be a little a little more structured, where you are paying attention to like the edge work and making it not as frilly looking. But usually these kind of curls are secretly my favorite to draw because it implies like uh, almost filigree where it has the swoop at the very end and then it kind of ends off and then you can do another one. So wavy or curly hair like this is really fun to draw too. So curly hair is awesome. I don't want you guys to feel discouraged from drawing curly hair because it's too tough. I think you just have to go about drawing it differently than you would straight hair. So if you apply the same rules that you are with straight hair, Maybe you get a little lost then if you're doing curly hair. Um, okay. Oh, I'm sorry. You're right. These are these are cornrows. If I wanted to do locks, it would be down here, and they would be like in big sections. Sorry, I had a brain fart there. But uh, for locks, definitely use um, reference. And the one that comes to my mind is Moby from SSX3, and he had. Let me see if I can draw it really quick. So he had pulled back cornrows that were very thick, but then they were put in like a ponytail. And I just remember how cool these long dreads looked. And it was even cooler when you're snowboarding. Like they actually give some way to gravity where they would float, but they were so heavy that it wouldn't be like a ponytail where it was like flipping everywhere. But then when you like spun or something, you would see like the individual lock. Oh, I thought that was so cool. So Moby's actually one of my favorite characters. Uh, in, in SSX. Because of, which one was Moby? He was the um, black guy from Great Britain. He was awesome. Him and uh, I really liked Elise. She was like the main blonde. I, actually, most of the characters in SSX3 I like. I actually played each of them individually. Uh, anyways. Um, hey Tim, how do you draw your subject when it's constantly moving? Oof, that's a tough one. Uh, usually I'll imply gesture lines or like half draw a face. So if like a head was turning, let's say it was turning this way, I'd probably half draw it as like a ghost drawing on top of it. So it implies that it's like turning quickly. But usually I don't draw um, action like that. I like to keep it more uh, permanent, like in that moment, what do they look like? Um, <laughs> Digital is asking, I hate it when people watch over my shoulder when I'm drawing, but I love watching Tim draw, I don't know why. I felt the same way as you. I wouldn't even like let my friends watch me draw when I was in college. So it's kind of ironic that now I have people I've never met watch me draw, and I've become oddly uh, comfortable with it. Um, someone's asking when will Doodle Art Battle start again. We're thinking sometime in August. I actually kind of collected a new group of artists that want to do it, and we've been very passionate about getting together most nights and drawing, so I think we'll start it up again in uh, August. Um, oh, could you draw an afro in profile? So this is kind of an afro. It's not like a pure one where it's straight from here. But I'm telling you, try if you've never drawn um, hair that's been like thicker or more frizzy or afro-y, try it. It is one of the more fun things to draw for hair because you don't have to be as fluid and have transitions of values and those gradual uh, differences where you can just have fun with it. Oh man, yeah, there's a lot of questions on curly hair. Okay, here's a question, Tim. 
Oh, I, mean, I, I read this one. Well, I'll still answer it. Uh, Dave is asking, if you could steal another artist's drawing skills and their whole knowledge about their art, their visual library, creati creativity, and so on, which artist would you choose? Wow. Um, when you include visual libraries and stuff, it becomes harder. Where I think knowledge about the technical skills of drawing, especially traditional, I would choose Alan Williams. But in terms of someone that I regard as a visual library, like someone that's really strong with their visual library, that's a tough one. I think it would be an artist that is either not alive anymore, like um, maybe Norman Rockwell. Oh, man, yeah, that's a tough one. I, I think I'd have to think about that one. All right, I'm going to look through these as quick as I can. <laughs> oh, there's some funny ones. Um, okay, here's a question. Tim and Joe, do you prefer digital or traditional more? Or do you feel like you like to use them for different things? Um, Faith is asking this, and uh, right away I can tell you, I like to do both. I think there is a compliment when you do, you work in one, and then you're able to pull what you learn in that uh, visual medium, and then you're able to pull uh, back and forth constantly. And I think uh, even, I just watched something recently that talked about you have to find what medium or what way of expressing your art works best for you. And I don't think there has to be just one. And I think that's kind of the goal in reaching your full potential is, who knows, maybe sculpting is your calling. And this whole time you've been trying to do digital and it's not working, you get frustrated. But maybe try giving another area or another medium a try. Like even watercolors, maybe traditional painting is your, the way to go. So um, I would say for me, I, I definitely think traditional drawing, uh, doing digital, and then sculpting would be the three that I feel most attracted to. Yeah, I was going to say, it depends on what I'm using it for. Um, traditional, if I'm trying to do something slower, or if I'm really trying to understand form, I really like the feeling of pencil on paper. And it's just, I can take my time, I'm more patient. Whereas I feel like now, since I've been using Photoshop a lot, and I can go back and erase, and it's, it's, it's a faster program, uh, it becomes kind of a little bit of a pitfall, because I tend to not want to take my time with digital, but at the same time, I mean, you have layers, it's it's pretty much an infinite canvas at that point, and it's, that's heck of a lot cheaper than going out and buying, you know, a new sketchbook every two months, or a ton of pencils, or colored pencils, or even paints, and acrylic canvases, uh, but yeah, it's, you know, they, you get, they got pros and cons for each, uh, but I, I, you know, I prefer working in both of them. Mm -hmm. Let's see here. <laughs> um, there's a question from Tijal that um, is about red. I'm not going to say it out loud, but just know you're kind of on the mark with that. Okay, another question is, you said recently that you would go out more and observe people and draw them. Have you done that yet? Are you happy with the results? I've done this recently and love doing it. People are interesting if you think uh, they think no one's watching. I wish I had my other sketchbook here because um, when I was on the trains in Australia, I would draw people that were sitting like two seats above me and either to the left or right. Uh, usually they were sleeping, which I guess gave to a more interesting canvas or a more interesting subject matter because I could constantly stare at them. Um, only once did they wake up when I was staring at them, <laughs> but I kind of looked away as if, oh, yeah, we just happened to catch eyes for that moment, but really I've been secretly drawing them for like the past hour and staring at them nonstop. So it's actually a little creepy when I think about it, but uh, that's the way it goes sometimes. Oh, <laughs> uh, someone said, dude, I totally figured out the bird bombs. You took out their hot tub, and <laughs> that's totally true. So maybe that's why the birds <laughs> keep running into the house, because the uh, hot tub's gone now. I bet you they're um, pissed about the bird bath. Yeah, right? <laughs> uh, you took away my, my luxury bath. Um, I think this might be the last question, just because we're... Well, I guess we got six minutes. We'll see how far we get. Um, Tejal is asking, has anyone ever stolen your work? I'm not talking about your sketchbook. I'm talking about copying your work or saying that they did it. If, if yes, how did you handle that? And this I actually learned from CG Cookie. And Wes is such a great 
uh, manager and boss that he kind of walks me through well, how you deal with something like that. First thing you do is um, check the sources, make sure that you know if someone's like, hey, I noticed someone stole your work, you should check it out. Definitely look at it and see like, is it the right, like, are they actually stealing your work? And if they are and ready for this, don't do anything about it. The worst thing you can do is get wrapped up in trying to sue someone or like getting them to um, get in this battle of who did it first and getting them to take it down. You can politely send them an email asking if they could take it down and know that you know we are the right we hold the rights to this image. But if they're more aggressive with a fighting back, just leave it alone because the people that actually follow you know who did it. And this happens to like Loesch all the time. I feel like even um, didn't this happen with Dave Raposa on the He-Man Masters of the Universe cover? Well, yeah, that was different though because that was fan art. Oh, that's true. So when it's original stuff, I guess there's a huge difference. But if someone steals your original stuff, then yeah, you either can fight it and get in this huge debate where literally you're investing so much time into something that you probably won't win. Or two, you just let it go. You brush it off and know that people that follow you uh, know that you did it. And I'm sure there's people, because there, even someone sent me a picture of red that someone stole, and they were like, Tim, this is yours. You should do something about this, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, you know, I, I appreciate it. I actually see it as a compliment that they use my art for something that they want to do personally. And, you know, it's that tough bullet when if they're making money off of it, yeah, it kind of sucks. But as an artist, I, I don't have the time. I don't have the... <laughs> the it, would, it, it would be exhausting. For me to try to fight that would be exhausting. So I think the thing I, I try to do is just blow it off, see it as a compliment, and move on to my next drawing. Because I don't, I don't have time to fight stuff like that. I need to keep producing the work that's in my head. Oh, sorry. I've got to keep reading that. <laughs> oh, Benedict, I am glad to hear that you are uh, recovering. Because I know I saw your email earlier this week. Man, we have the funniest people come to these streams. All right, here, this might be the last question. So from uh, Mizidora, which type of letter are you using? So this is the 0.3 millimeter pencil. And sadly, I don't use the actual art pencils. I don't know if this will focus. I don't use, like, the point, or the, uh, the H's and the B's, all those uh, more correct... Uh, used for drawing. I, I do plan to start getting into them, especially seeing Alan Williams really create awesome stuff with his darker, darker pencils, and I, I kind of want to create more uh, dark areas in my drawings because, as you can see, usually they're very light, and like the shadows are more or less implied. Where like you can still see shape and value in this, but like when you look at the hair, I literally have no value shading at all. And even on the front of the face, we have some value shading here, but um, it's very light. So I definitely want to get more into working darker and maybe experimenting with that a bit. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and switch back. Oops. All right, so thank you guys for coming to this live stream. Uh, remember, we do these every Wednesday at 2 p.m., and that's Central Time, and that's minus 5 GMT if you're outside of the States. And uh, usually the topic will be posted an hour or two beforehand. We'll post all the links, all the books that we talked about in the description. And um, if you guys want to see more of these sketchbook ones, I have no problem doing traditional sketches. I actually love doing traditional sketches. Even though the site's more built on doing digital, I think having a combination of both helps any artist. So if there's any suggestions you want to see, feel free to leave them in the community section. And... If you don't know what the community is, I definitely would go check it out. It's uh, CG Cookie. Let me check the. It's community.cgcookie.com. So I'll be posting on there frequently on things that uh, have influenced me or things that I want you to see that I feel are important to the art world. So I would definitely check it out. Maybe do some posts of your own. And yeah, uh, Joe, do you have any last minute thoughts? Uh, no, just like I said, check out the community, guys. It's uh, super, super helpful and. The more people we can get involved with the community, the more we can all grow as artists. So definitely check that out.
Yeah, it's kind of cool seeing as 5.0 rolled out. Now we're becoming, becoming, I guess, a central community. So I'm hoping to see that more. And I think me and Joel will become more involved, especially after, right now we're in a workshop, but after the workshop's over, I definitely see me and him um, adding more uh, to the community, and I can't wait to see it grow. All right, so take care, everyone, and we'll post the links uh, soon after in, in the community post and on the blog post on the, the main site. So thanks again for coming, and hopefully we'll see you next week. Yep. See you guys.